Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start, could I uh, just... I'm holding up my cell phone. I've set a good example by switching this off. Uh, the, these events are being recorded, uh, so if you could... I mean, it would, it would be good anyway to switch off your cell phones, but if I could ask you to do that, thank you. Um, my name's David Blackburn. I'm, I teach in the History Department uh, at Harvard, and uh, I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. So it falls to me this great pleasure of, uh, of welcoming you all on this really very, very special occasion, which we've been looking forward to for, uh, for a long time. Um, let me start with some, some thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for coming. Um, thanks to the staff at CES and to our uh, colleagues in, in the government department who helped to organize this. Um, to the uh, small committee uh, led by Peter Hall, which um, put together the panels, um, and not least to the, uh, to the panelists, the very distinguished panelists and chairs um, who agreed to, to talk. A agree, when I say agreed, that makes it sound much too passive. They were all, as you will readily understand, very eager to, to come and help us celebrate this occasion. We're here because of Stanley, uh, this remarkable man, um, scholar, professor, public intellectual, um, but more than that, uh, he has been a teacher and a mentor and a friend and a, and a colleague, and uh, in, in many cases of people in this room, all of those things rolled together. Uh, Stanley's actual birthday is on November 27th, so he shares his birth date with uh, Caroline Kennedy, uh, <laughs> Alexander Dubček, um, and as it happens, Jimi Hendrix. And I, I, and I'm confident that that's the first time. See things you can do with Google. I, 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 I just one of my graduate students just sent me a piece called "How Google Makes You Stupid," and I'm sure there's something in that. But, but it does allow you to find the hidden symmetries between between Jimi Hendrix and, and, and Stanley Hoffman. The, the birthday itself fell last Thursday on, on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, I mean, in a sense, what we're doing here in this room, and I'm sure that the overspill room upstairs is probably filled by now as well, is, is thanking Stanley for uh, everything he's done and everything he's meant to so many people. Um, uh, I'm sure that most of you will know that there is an electronic guest book uh, in which very large numbers of people have already uh, signed uh, signed in and recorded their personal thanks and, and, and greetings uh, to, to Stanley on his, on his birthday, um, people from Harvard and beyond. Even within uh, Harvard, no, no single part of this great sprawling university has a monopoly on, on Stanley. Um, uh, he has colleagues and collaborators in the, in the Kennedy School. Uh, uh, the social studies program, um, which he did uh, more than anybody else to, to set up, uh, uh, is a part of the university that, uh, um, that owes him an enormous amount. I was thinking the other day, if, if, if Stanley had left the university in 1970, he would still have placed his stamp on it because of his contribution to social studies in setting up this institution, uh, and perhaps not least, uh, his his wise counsel in the late 60s during the student troubles when he took an opposite view to that of my history, the then historian Alexander Gershenkron, right, that the students are Bolsheviks, they should be beaten, beaten, beaten. Uh, Stanley took, a, as you'd expect, a more irenic view. Um, but happily he didn't leave the university in 1970. Uh, th those of us introducing these events uh, represent those two institutions with uh, which he's been particularly strongly associated, and Nancy uh, we'll speak in a moment uh, as the chair of the government department. Um, as director of CES, I, I just want to place it on record, something you all know, that without Stanley, no CES. Um, Stanley is 80. Next year, uh, CES will be 40. Uh, he has poured half of his life into CES, and for that, all of us here uh, are enormously grateful. Thank you for that, Stanley. If I could end by reflecting a little bit on birthdays with zeros uh, as I approach my own 60th next year. Um, I, 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 I could almost publish a book of, of, of birthday speeches, I think. I, 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 earlier this year, I, I uh, sp spoke at the celebration for Charlie 
uh, Mayer's uh, 70th, we, uh, an event held slightly before the, the biological landmark itself, which is the beginning of next year. Last year, uh, I spoke at um, birthday celebrations for two 90-year-old men. Uh, one was my father. Uh, the other was a, uh, a long-standing colleague uh, and friend, another great Central European intellectual, as I think of Stanley, that is Eric Hobsbawm. Um, Eric was, of course, born in 1917. What other year would he have been born in, 1917? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Eric is going strong at, at 91. Um, so it's, I, I feel as if I'm really uh, 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 welcoming you to a celebration of this mere callow youth of 80. Uh, 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 Eric at 91, uh, Stanley at 80. Stanley, uh, I know I'm speaking for everyone uh, here and in the room upstairs and well, well beyond uh, when I uh, open these proceedings with uh, a great and very sincere word of, of, of thanks for everything you've done. Thank you. I'm Nancy Rosenblum, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the government department. As David just told you, along with social studies, which Stanley co-founded in 1960, and CES, government is one of Stanley's three academic homes. And I think we can say of the government department that we're probably his most familiar and even most comfortable Harvard battlegrounds, since the fights that he, the fights that he has there recur over and over and over. And I think that we've com doubtless contributed to his fascination with Sisyphus, which he's <laughs> te te teaching this year. In, in 2005, the government department had its own in-house celebration of Stanley's 50th anniversary of teaching at Harvard complete with photos of Stanley then and now, and a file of Harvard Crimson articles about him. That file reports, as you might expect, a half a century of American political history as it was made, debated, defended, and of course protested by faculty and students here. There's the 1962 interview in which Stanley talks about the UN, and the young reporter says, Hoffman is unperturbed by the results of the UN's decline, and he quotes Stanley as saying, what did you expect? <laughs> there's, there's the 1963 interview in which Stanley defends de Gaulle's stand for an autonomous French atomic force against the charge that it's the unrealistic action of a disruptive delinquent. There's his vital support for anti-Vietnam War activity on campus, and an article on a 1994 forum attended by hundreds in which Stanley expounded on the new world disorder. In an interview, a, a three-week sick leave in 1995 made the Crimson's front page. Uh, and in an interview this year, just to bring it up to date, Stanley lamented student passivity in the face of the Iraq war and said, the notion that the only thing one should do is concentrate on academic issues, do the next term paper, is idiotic. Well, today, today's occasion is not a 53rd anniversary of Stanley at Harvard. Today we're celebrating Stanley's work and intellectual influence, which we all know did not begin and does not end in Cambridge. We're grateful to all of you, Stanley's colleagues, for coming. And it's clear that we're going to need a third celebration devoted entirely to his kindness. about so many things that um, one has to feel for the people who try to pack it all into one afternoon here. You divide Stanley's interests into two halves, international relations and, and uh, French politics. And in international relations, you're still left with three modest categories, American foreign policy, ethics in international relations, and war and peace. Um, so there's a lot to talk about uh, here. Um, and this is really part of a continuing conversation. Uh, there was a session at American Political Science Association meeting uh, that we lectured next week at Princeton. Uh, many of us have been having these conversations uh, for uh, years uh, and decades. Uh, I'm really up here to direct traffic, and what we really want to do is leave time uh, so that we continue the conversation uh, afterwards. So we have three eminent 
friends of Stanley's and scholars who need no introduction is going to take them in the order. Each one will speak for no more than 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up, starting with Bob Cohen on uh, American foreign policy. Thank you, Andy. It's a great honor to speak at this birthday celebration for Stanley, whom I have known since I entered Harvard Graduate School 47 years ago. Uh, in a sense, Stanley, you seem younger to me now than you did then, because then you were Professor Hoffman up here, and I was a callow 20-year student. Uh, and now you're a friend and, and, and former colleague. Now, I could tell stories in my 15 minutes about being Stanley's colleague, and especially about his relentlessly critical spirit. I could tell a story about our making a presentation on a joint paper of ours in this very room, when I, who was supposed to know something about game theory, made the mistake of going first. I was presenting the first half of the paper, and Stanley, instead of presenting the second half of the paper, attacked the first half of the paper. <laughs> so that's the only story I'll tell if that's on the, on, on, the guest, on the guest book. At APSA in, in September, I talked about Stanley's, Stanley's interpretation of international relations, and I characterized him as an empirical fox and a moral hedgehog. That is, in Berlin's sense, as a hedgehog, he, knew, he knows one very important thing. Ethics are crucial to foreign policy. As a fox, empirically, he knows many things. He doesn't take the view that we have one key to history or international relations. And in, in, in my view, it's advantageous for the ethical hedgehog to be an empirical fox. Knowing that ethical values are, are, are crucially important for world politics is central to his approach, but equally important is a multidimensional understanding of reality. Uh, but today, my assignment is to focus on Stanley's work on American foreign policy, so I'll speak about that. One of Stanley's most distinctive and lasting contributions is his, his brilliant portrayal of, of the American national style in Gulliver's Troubles, 1969. In that volume, Hoffman argued, quote, that Amer America's besetting sin is not moralism or idealism or legalism, unquote, but rather what he called, quote, formulism and formalism. Formulism means, in his terms, the reduction of complexity to, quote, the holy simplicity of a hallowed slogan, unquote. Formalism denotes a failure to appreciate political, historical, and social processes that lie below the surface. But for Hoffman, formulism and formalism are accompanied by principles that take the form of, quote, abstract dogmas and moral imperatives. These principles do not constitute ideologies, but they share two features with ideologies quote, their supposed transcendence of national interests, unquote, and their rootedness in general views about human nature and society. It seems to me that the natural consequence of formalism and formulism, in Hoffman's terms, and the abstract principles that they accompany, is that lecturing others becomes the manifestation of the American national style. The lecture by the president, the secretary of state, she's very good at this, or the secretary of of defense becomes America's characteristic means of diplomacy. The American official begins with general principles, peace, security, economic growth, democracy, and then tells audiences how they should act to achieve those goals which so happens to conform to the interests of, of the United States. Lecturing others has become so ingrained in American foreign policy that it seems to come naturally to our foreign policy elites of either party. It was true in the Clinton administration and it's likely to be true in the Obama administration. But this afternoon, I want to contrast lecturing with two other approaches that, that Stanley has also uh, discussed that can be employed by great powers that want to make a difference in the world. Bargaining and institution building. Bargaining is, of course, the realist approach to foreign policy. Great powers negotiate with one another, warily exchanging less valuable concessions by themselves for concessions of greater value to them by others. Metternich and Bismarck are often seen as the heroic figures of such great power diplomacy, although I see Salisbury as also one of its master practitioners. Faced with a series of conflicts be, uh, with the United States at the turn of the 20th century, Salisbury's cabinet made a series of bargains in which Britain made concessions on the Canadian border, that is, sold out the Canadians, for those of you in the room who are Canadian, and, and in Panama. Henry Kissinger says somewhere that the mark of a statesman is the ability to see that it's often wise to sacrifice material gains for intangible ones. Salisbury understood this and got a century's aid and, and protection for the United States in return for a little bit of essentially worthless willingness and the sacrifice of, 
of some treaty privileges in Panama that would have been swept away soon in any event. The United States has pursued a policy of bargaining with China, which may explain why, why China policy is one of the few successes of, of the Bush administration. We don't lecture China as much. We bargain with them. Uh, but toward much of the world, we seem to prefer to offer lectures on sovereignty or self-determination, democracy or the war against terror. The obvious hypocrisy of, of these lectures is only an ordinary vice, as Judith Sklar, our dear, our dear departed friend, would have said. But lectures can get in the way of bargains. The other mode of diplomacy I, I want to mention is institution building. Of course, institution building requires bargaining, as Andy Moravchik's work on the European Union shows so brilliantly. But the core of institution building as a foreign policy practice is to alter uh, participants' interests and incentives by making cooperation more productive through creating, uh, facilitating frameworks and enhancing mutual credibility. Institutions are worthless without uh, a potential common interest, but given these interests, they can make it easier for states to realize them, and they can reduce the chances that feuds will escalate. Yet institutions only help if many stakes have stakes in them. This means that all states have to make concessions. The United States used to be the chief institution builder in world politics, but Europe has recently become the champion advocate of institutions. Not surprisingly, perhaps, the Europeans have learned, learned a few lessons from us about moralistic lecturing as well. An institutional strategy is convenient for Europe, since it is overrepresented in, in the old institutions, and typically European states are the founders of the new ones. European countries were the principal foot draggers in the renegotiation of IMF quotas to newly emerging economies over, over the past couple of years. Uh, I suggested last month at, at the British Foreign Ministry that if Britain and France really wanted UN reform, they could offer to give up their individual seats for an EU seat, a uh, conditional on, on other reforms they desired. Somehow they have not taken me up on this suggestion. Hypocrisy is, not, it is an ordinary vice. It's not limited to the United States. A little bit of lecturing is quite acceptable in world politics when subordinated to a combination of bargaining and institution building. But when lecturing because of substitute for bargaining and institution building, it will simply be, see, be seen as hypocritical posturing. Leaders of dominant states may get away with it because no one dares object, but the lecturing leader of a declining power or one with, with exorbitant ambitions is likely to be ineffective. And one of the most perceptive passages of Gulliver's Troubles unfortunately buried in, in the middle of a paragraph on page 383. You see, the student never gets away from being a student and showing that he read page 383. Uh, uh, Stanley says that, quote, a great power is a nation that succeeds in adapting its style and institutions to changing patterns of international relations. How well has the United States adapted its lecturing style, principled, formalistic, and formulistic to changing conditions? Arguably, the American style was well adapted to the Cold War. The scattered, often demoralized, non-communist countries of Asia and, and Europe look to a leader with a plan, a formula for recovery and security. The United States had that formula. America's formula was combined with a penchant for institutions, which reinforced its material and military power and made its promises more credible. Combined with great self-confidence, the result was a combination of hard power and soft power that the, that the Soviet Union could not hope to match. Bargaining was, sec was secondary. The Cold War did not end with a grand bargain, but with, with Soviet collapse. Hence, the United States did not have to adapt its national style. Much of the work of foreign policy was done by its dynamic economy and its free society. Its formulistic lectures, such as those of, of, of President Ronald Reagan, <laughs> seemed simply to make explicit the flow of history. History did not come to an end in the 1990s, but its course shifted. In an odd way, the American style of lecturing others seemed to fit the new conditions just as well as the old ones. Who could now doubt, except Stanley and a few others, that the United States was riding um, a wave, a democratic wave of historical change. When President George H.W. Bush proclaimed a new world order, he was serious, no matter how, how lugubrious this seemed to seasoned observers of world politics. The United States had lectured others on, on, on what to do, and now they seemed actually to be doing it. Its leaders even sought to promote their neoliberal vision of, uh, of world capitalism, in which states would not do naughty things in financial crises, such as, as bail off their banks and reflate their economies. 
You may recall the 1998 uh, IMF crisis when the United States came down hard on, on those states that had, had the temerity to think about doing such things. And the United States had both the material resources and the institutions through the 90s to implement this vision. During the last decade, however, much has changed. Our social and economic practices increasingly set us apart from other democracies. The American public support for the death penalty, the U.S. Um, um, uh, blatant violation of international law, uh, uh, with torture in, in particular, uh, and our poorly regulated capitalism, which has caused problems for us and the whole world, uh, have, have helped to generate a, a financial crisis and have made us less the subject of admiration than we were. The United States squandered immense amounts of hard and soft power in its virtually unilateral invasion of Iraq. Donald Rumsfeld's lectures about New Europe and Old Europe did not appeal to our, our long-term allies. Uh, and the most serious financial crisis uh, since the Great Depression has weakened the base of American power and made a mockery of our attempts to maintain control over international financial institutions. The summit meeting of November, November 14th, which had no results essentially, was a marker of this shift. Under these conditions, lectures cut less ice. As, as Fried Zakaria has emphasized in the post-American world, the United States is no longer central to a number of developments in world politics, including relations between the two largest countries, India and China. The United States is still very powerful, and its economy re remains resilient with great potential for innovation. We are at the center of, of many important networks, as Anne Marie Slaughter emphasizes it in a piece about to, to appear in foreign affairs. But the U.S. is no longer as dominant as it was in, in the 1990s or the 1960s, and, and it was not, not lucky to re, return to that situation. Others continue to listen to us, but they are less inclined to bow their heads or bend their knees. In my view, the United States should take Stanley's advice of almost 40 years ago. We need to adapt our national style. There is no need to abandon our principles, but we, uh, we need to engage in more bargaining, including with adversaries, and more institution building, especially with those that have common interests with us. Lectures should be mostly relegated to the classroom and to forums such as this one. Thank you very much. Well, un until uh, David spoke to welcome us, I hadn't thought about the, those extraordinary moments in the 1960s when the Harvard faculty divided and, and Stanley and I um, were engaged in what we called the liberal caucus and they called the radical caucus. And, and we called them the conservative caucus and they called themselves the moderate <laughs> caucus. And, and the issues there were ethics in one university. I'm supposed to talk about ethics in international society, which may be a harder arena, or, or maybe not. Um, and for me, that means talking about uh, just, just war, just war theory. Uh, there's a big debate going on in philosophical circles these days about the theory. And I've been defending it against various academic, and I stress the word academic, attacks. The defense is, in my view, the intellectual version of a just war fought for the sake of just <coughs> war theory. The current critique is remarkably different from Stanley's criticism of just war theory in Duties Beyond Borders, published 27 years ago. And I want to make that difference my subject today. Needless to say, the difference is very much in Stanley's favor. Rereading his book, and especially the chapter on the use of force, I'm struck by its timeliness. The arguments could be repeated today, and my counter-arguments, when I figure them out, could also be repeated. And all the people who heard those arguments, whatever their own views, would recognize their relevance on the ground these are consequential arguments. Today's philosophical arguments, by contrast, are timeless, as philosophical arguments are, I guess, supposed to be. 
one could join them at any time in any place and their outcome would make no difference at all on the ground. <laughs> These are profound, no doubt, but inconsequential arguments. So I'm going to say something about this contemporary criticism and then turn to Stanley's 1981 book. So I express my irritation first and my appreciation second. Um, the, the first of the current philosophical critiques has to do with the moral equality of soldiers. And that is the fact, as I take it to be, that ordinary soldiers on both sides of the battlefield are equally entitled to shoot and, and possibly kill their opponents without being called criminals. It follows from this that if captured, they are not put on trial, but guaranteed benevolent quarantine for the duration of the war. And this is so whether they are fighting in a just or an unjust war, as we see justice and injustice, or even as God sees it, God's view being the philosophically privileged view from nowhere. <laughs> Critics claim that this moral equality makes no sense. How can soldiers fighting an unjust war have a right to fight? Do the members of a criminal gang have a right to shoot at the police? When soldiers in an attacking army kill soldiers who are defending their country, the killing is murder. The soldiers are murderers, literally. They are guilty as individuals, one by one, of the crime of killing innocent people, namely the soldiers on the other side. And it is wrong for just war theorists to deny this fact, as the critics take it to be, since the denial makes it much harder, um, much, much easier to recruit soldiers for unjust wars. This critical argument would make a lot of sense, it seems to me, if war were a peacetime activity, like robbing banks. <laughs> like robbing banks, for example, where it's obvious that the robbers and the bank guard are not moral equals and don't have the same right to fight. In international society, military conflict doesn't have or rarely has the same obviousness. And just war theory represents an adaptation of morality to the character of international society and to the circumstances of war. War is a coercive and collectivizing experience. And a morality focused on the intentions and actions of individuals won't do justice to that experience or to the men and women caught up in it. Caught up is the relevant phrase. They are morally caught up as very young members of a collective, pressed by parents, peers, preachers, and teachers to adopt the collective view of the world and the war. They are politically caught up as citizens responsible for the well-being of their country. They are physically caught up as subjects of conscription and military discipline. <coughs> Even wartime volunteers are often not acting in ways that meet the philosophical understanding of voluntary behavior. They too are subject to social pressure and then to the discipline of the army. <clears throat> the, the American poet Ivor Winters got the argument right in a poem that he wrote in 1942. The times come round again, the private life is small, and individual men are counted not at all. Now life is general. The second critical argument is a philosophical deconstruction of double effect, the old Catholic doctrine that attempts to set limits on what we now call collateral damage. A civilian deaths are the key example. Stanley has also made some criticisms of double effect of a different sort, Now I'll come to them later. The, the doctrine holds that when, this, when the damage, when the civilian casualties are the unintended side effect of a legitimate military operation, an operation aimed at a military target, and when the damage isn't disproportionate to the probable benefits of attacking the target, it is permitted. By contrast, intentional attacks on civilian targets and disproportionate injury to civilian populations are condemned and prohibited. Now, in domestic society, we impose much tighter constraints on the police, who cannot go around killing innocent people, claiming that their deaths are not disproportionate to the value of capturing 
this particular criminal. Some contemporary critics would impose the same constraints in wartime, pretty much banning collateral damage, which makes fighting morally impossible, except perhaps at sea or in the desert. The ban, for obvious reasons, won't work. And then there are no effective limits at all on collateral damage. There's no moral virtue in minimizing the number of civilians you kill if you are a murderer as soon as you have killed any at all. And yet minimizing the number of deaths is exactly what we want soldiers to do. If we acknowledge the on-the-ground realities of wars and battles, we will be able to understand some of the peculiarities of justice in war, which is not the same thing as the ordinary morality of domestic social life. But the acknowledgment may also lead us, as it leads Stanley, to wonder whether the adaptation of ordinary morality to the circumstances of war has gone far enough, whether it actually reaches to, whether it actually addresses the sheer horror of modern warfare. This is a worry, especially in the case of Jus in Bello, conduct on the battlefield. And Stanley's criticisms are focused there. With regard to Jus ad bellum, the justice of the decision to go to war, he accepts, I think, the restrictions and the permissions of just war theory, though he would like to extend the restrictions with a new jus anti et contra bellum, justice before and against war. He is, for good reasons, radically reluctant to go to war, a position that looks especially wise these days. It was probably wise in 1981 also. Stanley's criticism of Jus in Bello consists mostly of a set of worries that we all ought to share. I, I decided long ago that the world is divided into people who worry and people who don't, and my lot is cast with the worriers, and Stanley's is also. His first worry is that the collateral damage that the rule of double effect is supposed to limit may in practice be so immense as to make the fact that it is unintended and the claim that it is proportional morally meaningless. This is not the same as the argument that all collateral damage is immoral. Stanley would agree that if the damage can be limited, it should be limited. And the willingness to set limits and live by them is commendable, even if it is rare. So the capacity of new weapons to hit specific military targets and minimize collateral damage should be recognized as enabling the limits of the double effect doctrine. This is a case where can implies ought. But there is a second worry. What if the damage called collateral helps to win the war? This is a standard utilitarian argument that Stanley doesn't quite accept, doesn't finally accept, but rightly insists that we must take seriously. What if fighting according to the moral rules means prolonging the war with all its horrors while a single horrifying attack, horrifying and immoral attack, will bring a quick end? The difficulty here, as Stanley says, is that, the, is that the prediction of a quick end made with great confidence has a way of turning out to be wrong. But he also says it is unlikely that political leaders will forego opportunities to win by immoral means when their state locked in war, I'm quoting now, squirms on the floor of survival. How can we ask them to accept terrible risks for their country and their people in order to fight justly, in order to fight well. And in any case, asking is not the same as expecting that the risks will in fact be accepted. And there's a third worry, that even if statesmen and soldiers were prepared to take some risks, if not terrible risks, to save civilian lives or to minimize civilian deaths, it is increasingly difficult in contemporary conflicts 
to, to distinguish combatants from civilians. When the combatants are political militants, insurgents, guerrillas, or terrorists who fight in civilian disguise from within civilian populations, often with civilian sympathy or support, it is peculiarly hard to fight back in ways that we would want to call just or, or moral. And yet, no political leader will, I'm quoting Stanley now, no political leader will leave his adversary with a monopoly on terror and a relative immunity from counter blows. Now, these worries all appeal to the actual circumstances of war. They are not academic worries. They follow from an acute sense of the pressures that statesmen and soldiers come under in wartime. These are the real arguments, the arguments that we have to have. I am probably a little more optimistic than Stanley about the possibility of just conduct in war, but my optimism was shaken a bit by an article in the, in the New York Times a little more than a week ago reporting on a survey by the Surgeon General which found that fewer than one half of U.S. soldiers and Marines serving in Iraq thought that non-combatants should be treated, quote, with dignity and respect fewer than one half, you would have thought that they would at least have known how to respond to a survey. <laughs> and that 17% and that thought that all civilians should be treated as insurgents. Caught up in an ugly war, many soldiers, perhaps most soldiers, don't have moral impulses. Morality must be imposed from above, and political leaders may be disinclined, as ours have been, to do that if they think that battlefield effectiveness requires something else. Still, optimistic or not, I recognize the wisdom of Stanley's 1981 argument that, and I'm going to quote now, we should not pose the problem of ethics and international affairs as a problem of morality versus politics even though political judgments often violate ethical standards. It, it is, I'm still quoting, it is through the right kind of politics that some moral restraints can become practicable and observed. So here we have what I will call the Hoffman Doctrine. Politics and morality must be made to march together, despite the fact which we know to be a fact that they will not always or easily march together. Political leaders will defend their state and their people against the terrible risks of defeat and destruction, even at terrible costs to the other side. <clears throat> but a lot depends on their political judgment of risk and cost, and judgment can be educated. We can argue, for example, that the risks of an extended diplomacy are less than the risks of immediate war. We can argue that the terrible costs we are capable of imposing on the enemy will have political costs for us greater than any military benefits. Those arguments may sound like a surrender of morality to cost-benefit analysis, but that isn't so. Rather, they reflect the recognition that we sometimes need reasons in addition to our moral reasons for reaching a moral decision. Making arguments like these when they're right is the task of the engaged academic, of any intellectual or professor who believes, first, that there are duties beyond borders, and second, that there is a real world outside the academy where these duties have to be negotiated and enacted. That's a task that Stanley has worked at in the best possible way for a very long time. Thank you. It is for me an honor and a privilege 
to be able to pay tribute to all that I have learned <laughs> in multiple ways from Stanley Hoffman for the model of intellectual acuity and moral wisdom that he has been for four decades for me. And it is equally a privilege to share the platform with Bob Cohane and Michael Walzer. I have chosen the topic of war and peace not because it is the only theme of Stanley's vast scholarship, but it seems to me to have been a lifetime preoccupation. Stanley has woven together, he has told his students often, his personal experience of war as a young man in Europe under the shadow of Hitler with a lifetime of scholarship about why war occurs and what one can do about lessening the possibility of it. His personal experience catalyzed his scholarship, but the scholarship also was shaped, I think, by his personal experience at key points in the narrative. Knowing that Michael Walzer was going to address the ethics of Stanley's work, I was not about to compete with that. I'm from a tradition of prudence. <laughs> <laughs> And so, therefore, my concentration is more on Stanley's assessment of war in its political strategic dimensions, but never without its moral character. I begin with what was once called at Harvard Social Science 112, the course on war. I use the term the course with capital letters. Stanley comments in his autobiographical account in the book edited by Michael Smith and Linda Miller that it was his course on France that was, quote, his thing, end quote. But never having taken that course, it seemed to me that you can entitle Social Science 112 as the course marking this unique weaving of personal experience and scholarly analysis. It was, I take it, a signature course at Harvard for a long time, notable in the first instance for its scope and range, covering the period from the 5th century BC to the present, cutting across two semesters, 30 weeks of lectures. And in it, one found the personal and the academic. Certainly, as Michael has already indicated, uh, you don't come away from Stanley's discussion of war with a sense that he is all at all enthused about it, its nature, its consequences, and its frequency. But there is a dimension at which he stops, it seems to me, stops along the way of an argument that would rule out all war in a moral sense. And it is that personal experience of knowing what happens when there is concentrated power at the service of evil and no one ready to stand against it. At a certain point, in spite of all his ambivalence about war in its moral and political dimensions, the personal experience drew a line that said, sometimes in international politics, force is necessary. Therefore, the obligation is to be sure that it is used both with political acuity and moral wisdom. 112 was an amazing personal experience. The course was grounded in history, structured by the questions of Hobbes, Kant, and, and, and Rousseau philosophically, and then executed with mastery by an interplay of precise analytical social science and persistent moral critique. His essay, Sound and Fury in the State of War, reflects the themes that were played out in this unique educational experience. The course itself was given right at the heart and the high point of the nuclear age, perhaps at its most intense time in the 1960s. Stanley has been a selective but sustained participant in the nuclear debate, in works running from the state of war through living with nuclear weapons to Gulliver's, Gulliver's tr Troubles Stanley has been a selective participant because he was never consumed by the nuclear debate, never totally consumed by that dimension of warfare. But his engagement was unavoidable given his political and moral posture about war. I think his distinctive contribution in the treatment of the nuclear age was the way in which he consistently connected the nuclear challenge 
to the essential dimensions and dilemmas of world politics. Stanley did not treat the nuclear age principally in terms of numbers or acronyms or scenarios of strategic planning. It was much more about respecting the newness of the challenge that nuclear weapons posed, both in their quantitative destructive capability and in terms of the authentic newness it brought about in the way one thought about strategy. But this respect for the newness of, nucle of nuclear weapons never was developed apart from the lessons that might be called fundamental to any dimension of world politics. Even his way of describing things was different. Who else would describe the nuclear age in an article entitled Roulette in the Cellar, a distinctive title by any kind? And, but what he tried to do in that article was to demonstrate that while nuclear deterrence had authentically new dimensions to it, it was not totally new. That there was deterrence in the balance of power in 19th century Europe. That what was different was the stakes of failure of deterrence and also the way in which technology and speed had placed new and qualitatively different demands on statesmen as they calculated risk as they were willing to run risks for political objectives that in fact could end up being destroyed by one mistake in this arena. A second article that also connected the nuclear question to the more persistent themes in world politics was nuclear proliferation and world politics. Here Stanley used the lens of the problem of proliferation to dissect the different dimensions of world politics. He described a three-leveled universe of superpowers, middle powers, and the rest, and tried to compare the different perspectives that these different postures in world politics would bring to bear on this central problem. The care that the superpowers had been schooled to exercise by their constant attention uh, to the consequences of using nuclear war weapons would not necessarily be learned by newer nuclear powers with smaller stakes and smaller arsenals, but perhaps less hesitation about crossing the line from deterrence to use. In the face of these unique challenges, Stanley resisted radical solutions to the nuclear age. Radical on the one hand of being willing to cross the line, thinking of nuclear weapons as normal, if you will, and therefore usable. But he also resisted the radical solutions of those who thought one could move directly to disarmament in any sense of the term. What is interesting to me is comparing roulette in the cellar where he criticized those who thought there could be a radical, total, quick solution to the nuclear age. And a question I asked him this semester as we taught together in ethics and international affairs. He has the same doubts about the gang of four and their proposals that one could go to zero today. The names in the Gang of Four, of course, are marked by those who often thought that nuclear weapons either might be usable or were not quite as dangerous as Stanley found them. But he resists the notion that there's a quick solution today either. War was not just about nuclear weapons in the 1960s. It also was about Vietnam. In his autobiographical essay, again, in the Smith and... Miller volume, Stanley makes the point that his first article opposing Vietnam was in 1963. I was unaware of that, but my sense of Stanley on Vietnam began not with an article but an event. In a packed theater at Sanders Theater, he debated Mac Bundy on, on Vietnam, and that began a long conversation. His arguments about Vietnam, I, I thought, reached their sharpest point in his contribution to a volume by Richard Falk, where Falk brought together a number of essays on the war in the early 1970s. Stanley's argument essentially was that Vietnam was a case of escalating ends yielding expanding means. That is to say, as the stakes of Vietnam were invested by the US government with ever greater significance, arguments that it would be a failure in containment, that we would lose our credibility in international politics. As these stakes were constantly expanded, then the control of means 
and the options to take another course were diminished significantly. But while that argument about the dynamic of the Vietnam debate was central to exposing, I think, the character of the debate, his fundamental critique of Vietnam, of course, to some degree, had more to do with the topic that Bob Gohane has addressed, his persistent critique of the character and inclinations of American foreign policy analysis. For Stanley, Vietnam was not just tactically wrong, but fundamentally a misguided assessment, particularly of the internal factors of a society that we did not well understand. I always thought, again, his personal experience of growing up in France, of being French, of knowing the French experience in Vietnam, as well as in Algeria, gave him an early warning system that Vietnam was off track from the beginning. By the 1990s, Stanley was concentrating on many things in international politics, perhaps less significantly on war. But here again, the complexity of his thought surfaces. If anything, by 1990, as, as I think Michael has pointed out, Stanley was even less inclined to justify the use of force. And yet, in the era of the post-Cold War decade of the 90s, an era of exploding society, where the questions were not Berlin, Paris, Washington, and Tokyo, but rather were Somalia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Kosovo, Stanley once again reverted to a baseline that some use of force is both morally justifiable and politically necessary. And he framed a debate about justifiable intervention early in the 1990s that structured the argument for most of the decade. Many of us found both his treatment of both sovereignty and non-intervention in the same essay and the relativization of both so that neither was ignored but neither was given absolute status, neither sovereignty as absolute nor intervention as absolutely permissible. A more careful argument characteristic of his concern of the fundamentals of world politics yielded an argument about just intervention. Finally, terror and Iraq. A new threat to be sure, transnational actors with capacities to do damage that equaled the capacities of states. But once again, Stanley connected this new threat to the fundamentals of international politics, arguing that to isolate terrorism as a unique case that had nothing to do with other risks in world politics was a mistake. His argument against Iraq from the beginning was similar to his argument regarding Vietnam. There was once again an American overestimation of the utility of force and an underestimation of the complexity of another society, culturally, politically, and religiously. He argued early for exit, as he had argued for exit from Vietnam. And on this, it seems to me he was ahead of the curve, but I have to close by asking him two questions. Having argued for exit, I pause before the conclusion. One, it seems to me the war was wrong from the beginning, but it does seem to me we have, in a sense, established obligations for ourselves, precisely because of the ineptitude of the war. And so the question about exit must be measured against those acquired obligations. And finally, perhaps the most difficult question, if exit results in what some argue could be catastrophic potential genocide in Iraq, if that happened, would we have obligations to re-enter? Those are questions that I find beyond me, but they're certainly not beyond Stanley's capacity to answer. Thank you.
seems to me the reason, the way I understand the four, uh, they have published several articles on it. Uh, I've been at some meetings with them. Uh, the reason is that we have entered a universe where the rationality of governments in dealing with nuclear weapons is no longer the guide. But we have entered a world of nuclear weapons where you have other kinds of actors. How do you deal with it? In the old world, we could agree on rules. It worked. We were lucky. They will not accept rules. And their conclusion is, we have to reopen the debate of getting rid of the stuff completely. Although we know we won't get it fast. But the, the goal must be there, the vision must be there. And it seems to me also, one of the motives, particularly for, I think, people like Henry Kissinger, is that they, without saying so, are immensely frustrated with the incapacity of the Bush administration to deal with the issue and their total negation of all what has been achieved in nuclear arms control. And their refusal to face all these issues, whether it's the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, all the obligations that came out of the prolongation of the non-proliferation treaty. So, back to the question, isn't it a new universe? Don't we have to address the issue? of a zero, not right away, but in the long run? Well, I guess Stanley would <coughs> be free of answering questions. I, I don't know. Let me just, I mean, my, my sense is the, uh, the uh, uh, it, it's hard to contend with the value of the objectives if the objectives were possible. It seems to me what Stanley points out often on every question that he addresses is unintended consequences, overlooked dimensions, and of confidence about our ability to work our way through things too quickly. Uh, if they won't obey rules, uh, the part of the part of the question, I suppose, is are they going to are they going to obey rules or going to zero? I mean, I mean, that is to say, if new actors are in pursuit of these weapons, uh, that raises the question. I admit about whether the currency has any utility regarding these weapons or not. Yeah, yeah, but it's the governments that go to zero. Okay. And so they can do it. It's not the new actors in order to prevent the new actors from getting access to it. Then the question of the connection of whether that there is causality there from one to yeah, the other. That, is that really going to be possible? Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. end. Yeah. You must say that my, my fear is that it's going to be very, very hard. if one more serious about that direction and that goal is a considerable strengthening of uh, international intervention. <coughs> and we are very far from that. Uh, what it would require a, a, a sort of core of inspectors allowed to go and look uh, all over the place. Uh, very interested. And uh, if we had had that, uh, and if there had been some confidence in such a system, there would have been no need for the war in Iraq, among the other things. Uh, but simply saying, uh, let's go to zero, one has to remember that, uh, at least during the Cold War years, uh, the existence of nuclear weapons has probably uh, been a good thing. Not anymore. Well, It seems to me that the problem with the proposal, which I think is very simple, gets the incentives exactly wrong. Because the value of a small number of weapons, 50 to 
a much greater as, as nobody else, I guess. Absolutely. So it just, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, it seems to be a very wrong headed notion because it, it goes directly against the basic, a basic principle. If you want to set up an institution, you get the incentives right. It gets them wrong. It gives greater incentives to acquire the weapon. Others don't have any. That's why I think this is what's coming up for us. Well, that, that suggests that what we ought to be working for is effective state control of yeah, no. the Picking up on this discussion, oh, sorry, Alex Berg <coughs> from Columbia University, um, although currently in social studies and one of the many uh, people who owes his career to Stanley Hall. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> uh, it isn't the other um, side of this discussion, though, the fact that nuclear weapons might serve as a deterrence when in possession of weak countries? Um, a deterrence from invasion of powerful countries. And so, uh, I mean, the lesson of the last eight years or so has been the U.S. is unlikely to attack a country that has nuclear weapons and is only going to attack those countries that are so weak because they have no really effective way of countering uh, great power. And so when then the argument becomes we should get rid of all nuclear weapons, that has a way of making those who defensively seek to acquire weapons seem to be the aggressors. When the re one reason they might have the one nuclear weapons is to protect themselves from invasion by the United States. I mean, you know, legitimately one might say the reason Iran wants nuclear weapons is because it's surrounded by nuclear powers and it's a defensive response. But under this logic, it seems to be the, you know, aggressor. So the flip side is not just non-state actors, but non-nuclear powers might defensively want nuclear weapons, and that might serve as a deterrent against the great powers who do who could invade and dominate on the basis of non-nuclear okay. Michael Smith. I wanted to ask, uh, actually, Michael and Brian and perhaps Sally to weigh in on double effect a little bit more. Because it seems to me the, uh, the biggest threat to double effect is not only the one you mentioned, that is, we're not training people, they don't think about it, but the fairly radical expansion of what counts as a military target under, in the last two wars, I mean, attacking an infrastructure directly even if they're precision bombs, if you take sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants, all this stuff. Um, and even in the first Gulf War, we refused to release any estimates of civilian casualties, uh, which we had always done before. So it seems that there's, there's a uh, rhetorical lip service being paid to uh, double effect by our military planners. But uh, they're doing everything they can essentially to eliminate its meaning by, first of all, expanding the concept of what counts as a military target, and secondly, um, by essentially denying us the, the, the data of seeing whether we're being effective in targeting on the military targets. Mm -hmm. Given that, what, what prospects do you see on the ground for even your strengthened version of the double effect rule in just an under force having any real effect on the ground? Well, the first, uh, the first important um, benefit going to occupy the country, then it really makes no sense for it. For it. For it's not only immoral, but it's I mean, I think this, the first Gulf War was precisely this kind of case. And it, uh, I think the more complicated case was not water purification itself, but were dual use targets. Right. That is to say, it seems to me, if you took the strategy that was adopted in Gulf War I, which was to cut Saddam Hussein off from, from communication with his troops in Kuwait, then you, you then went after the communication system. But in order to go after the communication system, you had to go after the electrical grids. And when you got to the electrical grids, then you had an authentic dual-use target. In one point, from one point of view, it could be argued it was a military target. But only at second
second look, did you say that it is more than a military target? And the discussion about that then arose about how you characterize those kinds, those kinds of targets. I must say, from just some experience with dealing with uh, the military, just being asked to lecture before them a lot, uh, particularly <coughs> regarding air power, there is at least a willingness to argue these issues that if you look back to World War II, there's been a transformation of attitudes both in the general public and in the military. Obviously, in World War II, obliteration bombing was practiced without critique. There just was no argument even raised about it. It was only uh, 15 years afterwards that there was a kind of retrospective argument that surfaced all these arguments about double effects in civilians. In fact, I think you can argue that has gone a long way. Now, the question about then how one builds up sort of counterexamples to that is a reasonable point, but I take it to be uh, like Michael's point. It is the argument is now on the table, yeah. and they're, they're in a way that it wasn't before. The question about how far we can push it acutely is the issue. Anybody else on double effect? In order to stop ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, one bombarded the energy installations uh, of Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and precisely industrial targets. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that a justified means? You're assuming there was no other way of stopping ethnic cleansing in Kosovo? I don't think it was a, uh, uh, the kind of war which was being waged. of the law school. Uh, there's a great many references to morality, ethics, policy, and the like. I don't think I've heard the word law mentioned uh, in this discussion. Uh, Stanley was not oblivious or unaware of international law. And it's interesting, some of the topics, the question of bombing uh, a water treatment plant uh, is a question of ethics and morality, but it's also a question of the application of uh, the additional Geneva Protocols of 1977. Can, can I say something on that point? I'm struck uh, having come from uh, <coughs> having come from Europe at uh, uh, the very uh, strict the exceptions are always there. But the separation between law on the one hand and uh, uh, and politics, uh, including ethics uh, okay. on the other, uh, you would not have that to that extent. You know, law is, uh, even by people who are um, um, radical or, or, or peace makes, there's a tendency to consider that it is, uh, it's not very serious. And I think that's a very serious mistake. Mm -hmm. It has, I mean, law means something different mm -hmm. from ordinary diplomatic agreement, between or last day long and so on, but the tendency here is really quite different. Uh, in, in my department, uh, we've had occasional courses on international law. We have one uh, currently, thanks to, uh, to uh, the head of the Weather Institute, who does a great way. But we've had years and years without anybody teaching international law. And I think it feeds a little bit the attitude which was that of, Bill, uh, of the national. He is the one who 
one I was referring to when I said Jonah Heath Modern, so there are two things. There is uh, uh, there is ethics, and then there's there's reality. <laughs> and the other uh, the other person who insisted that we had uh, people who have a conscientious spirit, some role to play. But there were very few want to play. Mm -hmm. uh, when we had uh, uh, years ago uh, in uh, a visit before he became ambassador. To Mr. Bolton. <laughs> he gave the most unbelievable speech I have ever heard in a law school. It was all about might. Not say power, but might. We are stronger than everybody else. Uh, law is just uh, you know, a little bits of paper, something that uh, we used to be associated with German leadership of the age of 1940. Uh, the students were absolutely uh, dumbfounded. Uh, uh, and my his father was presiding and was, as usual, much too polite to be as bold as she could have been. It was extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. This is the man one sends as ambassador to the uh, But yet, it was simply a, a caricatured version of much of the teaching of international relations. missing a change, mm -hmm. a big change from the time I was a graduate student. I think mm -hmm. it's true, by the 1970s there was almost contempt for international law and social science. Partly, oh, because, yes. partly because the lawyers were so legalistic and Clark and Sullivan's yes. classic book was so unrealistic that we all dismissed it. No. Uh, but now you're seeing, you've seen in the last 10 years three major indicators of change. The first is that there are now a number of people who study and teach international law who understand the political science. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Abbott, my, my, my colleague and Dean Henry Slaughter, Harold mm -hmm. a number of people who are high prestige law professors or uh, legal scholars who really have done their political science. Work. That was not true. No, that was not. Uh, secondly, the political scientists uh, have talked much more about law in the last year. Mm -hmm. The International Organization had a special issue on legalization, which got a fair amount of attention mm -hmm. um, eight, eight years ago, and this would not have happened in 1980. Uh, and, and I think it's partly due to the realization. I did mention very briefly international law. I, I, I mentioned US, U.S. violations of international law with torture and history. And this relates to Joan I's notion of soft power. That in, insofar as much of the world believes that international law is important, mm -hmm. uh, American um, semi-realists themselves may not believe it's important have to consider it as, as, as part of a soft power. And I think you're seeing that kind of it has been notably absent in the Bush administration. Oh, yeah. uh, and John Bolton is the extreme example. But if you look at um, the patterns in academia, they're more favorable toward integration of law and policy now than they have been mm -hmm. other times in life. I hope you're right. The well, other not, not just regime theory, but constructivism and lots of other you know, people. Still not so yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the important point Stanley. is they cite lawyers. <laughs> Stanley, you construct it. You don't have to know what it is. You don't discover it. You construct it. My view of, co of constructivism is that it consists of saying something which is profoundly true. That people have ideas. <laughs> but not. Yes. Why is it spring time in the morning? Let me go back to a point that Stanley has dealt with, though, in terms of on the question of international law, because in the 1990s, on humanitarian military intervention, to some degree, you had a clash of morality. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, in the, the yes. standard argument about sovereign states and non-intervention, but it does seem to me that that has worked its way through in the course of a decade. Now, not all the way, but when you get to responsibility to protect, you've really got a proposal about changing, to some degree, the definition of sovereignty. And that, to some degree, has been an attempt to bring uh, morality and law into tension and dialogue, and there's been incremental change, at least, uh, that I think is an important dimension, because it does seem to me that the long-term relationship with morality and law is that, to some degree, the law will always be narrower than the moral arguments, yeah. and to some degree, what you're always trying to do is to expand the sphere of positive law by 
and inculcating it with a set of moral arguments that get consensually accepted. Anything else on law for the moment? Yeah. Um, pardon me, Mr. Cox, from the National War College. And uh, not only has Stanley tried to educate me, but so many other people in this room have done that. And I owe so much a debt to all of them, including so many. Uh, on the issue of uh, law, I'm a professor, allegedly a professor of law. Uh, the question I would pose, which is also conspicuous and asked in this absence in this session, was the International Criminal Court and our failure to sign up on that. And as Ryan Hare knows, we teach a lot about the law of armed conflict, which is a certain center in international humanitarian law, which some people don't think are exactly the same. But I'd be curious for the panel, because one of the arguments put forward is we haven't signed Protocol 1 and Protocol 2. And I would slightly disagree with you, Ryan, in the sense that Protocol 1 and Protocol 2 hold a higher degree of liability for general officers than we do under our RDCMJ. Are you concerned more about justice? Mm -hmm. And there is an extraordinary sense of the moral responsibility that dirty hand sets that commanders owe when they know things are taking place under their command, mm -hmm. which is different than the American mm -hmm. common law tradition. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious for this panel to say, where do you stand on those sort of issues? Because that will be front and center for the new administration as to whether or not we sign up for the ICC and whether or not we sign up for Protocol 1 and Protocol 2, which will be dramatic for the community if America does that, because we haven't been joining those particular international institutions, and a lot of our European friends are stunned by that. I, I wasn't sure what our point of disagreement was. I missed that. Okay. When you said isn't the moral, morality, law sometimes is, is falls short of morality. The law of Protocol 1 and Protocol 2 is a higher degree of morality right. than we currently have under our own American Municipal Court of Military Justice. It's one of the reasons why it's resisted. Right. I guess two points. One, uh, I don't mean the law falls short of morality. It, it seems to me it is always a step beyond moral debate to crystallize a consensus, a political consensus, either within a society or among societies, to turn it into positive law. In other words, you can have a valid moral argument that exercises restraint on people, but you may not get it accepted as law. I must confess that I don't know enough about Protocol 1 and 2 to be able to give you a, 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 a good example, a good answer to the question. I do think as a general tone, and because uh, it is the people who teach, there, uh, I was really struck. I did not see the article in the New York Times where all of these uh, people in the professional military uh, took no serious concern for combatants. My experience has been different, both in terms of dealing with people personally and watching policies that, in fact, there are, at the policy level, there are significant constraints built into bombing policy and risks that pilots take uh, because they're ordered to. to so this is a surprise. I can't really help you, Harvey, in the sense that I wouldn't venture an opinion on the basis of what I know. Let me make a general comment about the ICC and the question that's been raised here. Uh, it seems like this is a wonderful example of how important it is to do what Stanley has done all his life, to interpret world politics in a sophisticated way. And that one sees world politics as a story of material power and force and space. Mm -hmm. The ICC looks pretty meaningless. You say, where's the police force? Uh, they, have, they can't get anybody to the court because they have, they have no ability to arrest people. And so isn't this just uh, an absurd exercise in European, um, uh, was it correct, politics. But as you see world politics more the way Stanley has, in terms of networks and overlapping relationships, then you see three things about the courts that are important. One is that it is largely a matter of networks of local courts. And you ask not so much what the ICC has done, but how it's influenced the behavior of courts around the world in dealing with <coughs> crimes by heads of state and other people in power. Secondly, you look at your point about norms and ideas. How is it changing our view of how we should see uh, the activities of heads of state or leaders, leaders of movements in government, and whether they're criminally responsible for it? And thirdly, you see it, if you see it institutionally, you see it as a kind of institution which could have, have could turn out to have purposes or, or uses that were not thought of by the founders. There was a piece in the Times I was producing this week, or it was in FT. Uh, about uh, using the ICC against piracy. That's perfectly consistent with official international law. Why are these babies all circling around the pirates not doing anything for 
300 years ago, we knew how to deal with pirates. It's called universal jurisdiction. And the obvious place for it is the ICC, because no national court wants to take on the burden and externality of prosecuting pirates from some other place attacking some other country's ship. Um, so these are three examples of how the court is very important. But if, you don't, if, you're, if you're John Bolton, you don't see that. It's just <coughs> I would just add, two, two of us have been very influenced by Stanley. Tony Chase and I have looked very closely at Senate role in this. And uh, one of the things I noted was that the, I think there's only one exception. We've never ratified a major human rights treaty when less than 56 senators are Democrats. So count votes. Um, but on the other hand, even so, they usually tend to be stripped down a lot. So, um, you know, I think it would be a close call. And, and Congress would be a place to look, not the administration. Um, anybody else on international law? And and I've spent about the past 10 years teaching in tax and variant of standards, ethics, and IR course. So I wanted to come back to the responsibility to protect doctrine. Um, because Brian Hare was saying Stanley is attracted to uh, uh, formulations that take both sovereignty and intervention and use them both in relative ways. And sovereignty uh, responsibility to protect seems to do that. Um, and in 2005, I think one would have said responsibility to protect is the new answer to that question. Um, you have the General Assembly soft law resolution, so on. But I've noticed, especially among lawyers in the past uh, couple of years, an increasing sense of the responsibility to protect is, if not a dead letter, not our guiding uh, philosophy on uh, intervention. Um, it hasn't really, it hasn't been invoked by the, invoked by the Security Council very much, and never as a sort of direct uh, justification for an intervention. So I wonder where you see the responsibility to protect now as the answer to the question of uh, sovereignty and protection. To anyone? Well, I'm not sure it, I see it as the answer. Actually, I thought the Security Council resolution was came much more quickly than I thought it would, to be honest. I mean, if you look at the substantive argument, which you know, obviously, if you look at the substantive argument of that document in light of past understandings of what the UN Charter required regarding non-intervention, regarding when you could make arguments. It, even the arguments of Chapter 7, it seemed to me, always used to be the case that you couldn't intervene in a country unless there was such a stream of refugees flowing out of the country that they threatened international peace. So the classic case of could you intervene to do something within the sovereign boundaries of a sovereign state, that was uh, obviously at Kosovo a very disputed question among the lawyers. That's 1997. By the year 2000, you get the uh, Security Council resolution, you get the Millennium uh, the Summit uh, endorsing it. I think this is a process, and I think the most important thing are the substantive redefinitions that gone, have gone on in the document. And it, I'm not surprised that it would take more time than it than has gone by so far to get this. I, I must say, I may be naive about that, but I just think that that document has laid out the framework for an argument about <coughs> intervention. The problem with intervention now, it seems to me, is that it's been so poisoned by Iraq that now, as soon as you say intervention, you're going to have to have a disquisition saying, this is not Iraq. I mean, this is different. Don't you think if, if there had been a, um, a Charter that said engaged in the legal arguments. I'm not sure that the legal arguments are relevant until everyone is persuaded by the moral arguments. I think part of the problem is that in the case of, uh, uh, well, let's take that, that four, it would have required a, a positive vote of the security council, which wouldn't have come. Well, no, we avoided a result in the case of the 
say in strategic targeting, uh, but also uh, some of the points that Bob Cohen just made about international law and our evolution of our thinking about it. Uh, there are some realists and some liberals on both sides uh, of the coin who go through life temperamentally like sort of Benjamin's angel of history being blown forward through time while looking backward and seeing history as this wreckage piling up ever <laughs> higher. Uh, and I'm curious, I mean, we've heard about Stanley's long career and uh, the, the, the tragic early circumstances of his life, uh, how do the panelists and our guest of honor, uh, how have they seen progress or is there, has there been any secular progress in his various areas of interest, American foreign policy, morality and international relations, war and peace? Are we living in the same world we were when he started his career or have we moved forward or backwards? I'm very curious on your guys' thoughts on that. I'm happy to ask this one. Who goes <laughs> first? I think there's an easy answer to the question on U.S. foreign policy. Has there been progress uh, since, for example, 1960 until 2008? And the answer is no. There's been regress, most, most notably in this current administration. So we may uh, once again see a shift, but I don't think we have been able to show some progress. <laughs> Having had a philosopher answer the question, uh, I, I think you have to distinguish between moral vision and human practice. In other words, the only way you can get any improvement if you're talking about the interaction of politics and morality, you have to have some sense of vision of what structures your conception of what's appropriate in, in, uh, in human activity, whether it's interpersonal, societal, or international. If you use that, then I, I take, for example, the, the question of obliteration bombing in, in World War II as opposed to the arguments that exist today, intricate arguments that affect very concrete choices about targeting and in spite of the point that Michael yeah. made, very concrete choices about risk and, and what it does. Secondly, there were no human rights acknowledged in a legal sense in the, when Stanley began. The concept was not there. You had a declaration in 1947 that takes 20 years to get translated into international politics. The discussion of international economic policy in terms of some theory of justice, sort of whether you think you can expand Rawls to the international level or use some other. This conceptual debate simply was not there. And it does seem to me it makes a difference if you develop a set of standards, a set of ideas, a set of principles and norms, that you can do two things with them. Because it always seems to me that an argument like just war has a double meaning. The first meaning is it's a policy effort. So when the president says it's time to go to war, that's the beginning of the debate, not the end of the debate. And you've got a set of categories that can engage politics and strategy and hold its own and measure those two. The other thing 
is that these criteria give guidance to personal conscience. So even if you lose the argument with the state, if the state goes to war when you are convinced it's morally wrong, once again, you've at least got a structured set of categories by which the individual can say to the state, I will not serve. And it is not because I'm unpatriotic. It's not because I haven't heard what you said. I've heard what you said, and I find it morally unconvincing. That seems to me to be a plus, to, me, to, give, to provide a vision that gives you that kind of utility in three different areas of world politics. Bondi Stern, CFI. No, I didn't call him. Yes. yes. <laughs> John, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, with the withdrawal of American forces from Iraq, I like to think that we've reached the high water mark of uh, American expeditionary wars in faraway places. Nothing good has come out of this Iraq experience, as Peter Dalbray points out in his new book, Unforeseen Consequences. We have to put this thing behind us. It was a mistake. It was not in our national interest. I can sympathize with Brian Hare's notion that uh, something worse may come next, but it is not in our international interest to go back in there. Again. Uh, Lawrence Franco, a, a student of Stanley's, I believe in the first time the course war was um, offered. Uh, and um, also our paths crossed uh, on a number of occasions uh, afterwards, including um, sure. during the Carter administration in Washington. And for those who are uh, young um, or have um, fading memories, I can assure you that it's not only Republican administrations that go around lecturing others. Um, and, uh, which raises, but raises a question, and it also there's a segue here to the, to the, to the Darfur problem. Um, the, the, you, you pose, I'd like to, I'd like to um, ask the question of whether or not, in, in US, focusing on US foreign policy, um, isn't there a, a, a fourth item that wasn't on your list? I think it was lecturing, bargaining, and institution building. Um, again, I'm old enough to remember things like coalitions with allies because I was, I was sentient during the Eisenhower administration and, and uh, you know, we had allies back in those days. Um, <laughs> Uh, I find it interesting that um, the discussion so far seems to have focused completely on, um, on Americans and us Americans and our foreign policy. But how do you actually have a foreign policy that is something other than lecturing um, or effective, which involves effective institution building, unless you have allies who are willing to pull their own weight? Um, I hope I'm um, not insulting people in Europe too much in that what I'm about to say. But having lived in Europe a good part of my life, um, there is a free rider problem. And the fact that a lot of European <coughs> governments are only too content to be like the, little, like the Lilliputians to tie down Gulliver. But when Gulliver asks to, uh, for a little bit of help here and there, um, uh, or uh, just would you guys please assume your own responsibilities in your own backyard, as in Bosnia, uh, suddenly everybody flees. You know, uh, and uh, uh, two examples on that. On that one, um, the, uh, uh, it's not just in, in the, in the, in the uh, military area. Uh, what is, France has what one aircraft carrier now? Uh, Britain, uh, any? Um, uh, Britain, but oh, incidentally, I believe the problem is going to get worse before it gets better because it, it's. Uh, I live in the international financial world these days, <coughs> and if you think the U.S. economy's got problems, take a look at the U.K. Uh, France is better, but the UK is our only p partner, that, potential partner, that has any military ca capabilities. To, so, and, and maybe you need force in there, uh, in there somewhere. So, what? What? The, uh, oh, I was going to say, I'm worried the problem gets worse because um, not only are the European, or at least some of the European economies, in as bad a fix because of the financial crisis, or worse as we are, but uh, with the the escalation of their uh, pension, public pension. Uh, requirements, um, their, uh, their, their fiscal uh, deficits, which are going to balloon faster and more furious than, uh, than ours will, and their demographic de deficit, uh, isn't, uh, my, 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 you know, let me ask you if anybody, you know, disagrees with the forecast, please shoot it down. But they, although Sam's going to be, you know, sitting, sitting holding the bag for a long time, and, and institutions like the United Nations, uh, those are potential allies because the Security Council is made up more of potential adversaries than, than, than potential allies. 
So where, do, where, do, where does that leave us with a viable alternative to, uh, well, you know, if not lecturing, at least trying to persuade other people to uh, do things differently? Or what about the idea of, of, of a coalition of democracies and forming something new, um, uh, maybe loosely based from NATO? Well, the core, the core of the question, I think, is the question about uh, allies and, and the European and the U.S. And it seems to me that uh, there, there, is, there is indeed a structural if you write about There's always going to be one when there are the small countries and one or two big countries. We know that. Uh, and we know that hypocrisy, as I said, is a general phenomenon, not just an American phenomenon. And so we uh, are used to the discussion of civilian power in Europe as a, as a way of often escaping the most onerous responsibility. Uh, on the other hand, what we have to ask is, how does the, how does the great power, the power that seeks to lead an alliance, uh, generate alliances that work? And this is not different from institution building. It's, it is institution building, because a properly functioning alliance, NATO, when it functions properly, is an institution, uh, and an important one. And of course, it, it also involves bargaining. It involves being willing to follow a course of action which is broadly consistent with the other's interests. You hardly expect to go off in the direction we went attacking Iraq and expect others to happily follow if they think this is a foolish or pernicious operation. Uh, so that yet uh, there will always be this problem. There was this problem in the 50s and 60s, the free rider problem. Uh, but it can't be dealt with at all unless the, the purported leader, the would-be leader, decides to uh, listen to others <laughs> make some concessions <coughs> from their point of view, and to make uh, contingent bargains. That is, be willing to do things if they will do other things for it. I, uh, just, just on that question, uh, I, I just don't agree with the premise, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I think the view of the Europeans are free riders depends on viewing military <coughs> power as the only source of power in the international system. If you look at almost anything else, um, Europeans much or more than the United States does to global peace and security. So um, the most important thing I think Europeans have done is enlarging the European Union, which is, in my view, the single instrument which has contributed the most to global peace and security since the end of the Cold War. And that's a political commitment that no, at a great domestic political cost, support for European enlargement is in single digits in most of the 27 European member states, and they continue to pursue it. I'd like to see an American president that would be willing to take that kind of a political hit soon in light of foreign affairs strategy over a 20-year time span. Um, and that's just the start. I mean, they, most of the foreign aid, most of the support for international organizations, they take four times as many students um, from foreign countries as the United States. Um, the education system isn't as good, but they take more than many more. Uh, they're uh, the largest trading partner of every country in the Middle East. Um, they're uh, actually the values poll better for our You could go down the line. I mean, there are many ways in which the Europeans contribute to global peace and security. Plus, there's 70,000 European troops um, in combat situations in the world today. So, uh, you know, the United States contributes in some ways. Europeans contribute in other ways. I think there are a lot of Europeans who would like to see European military force deployed more efficiently. But just write the Europeans off as contributors to global peace and security because they, you know, aren't airlifting troops. I think is is a bit one sided. There is another point, really, which is that certainly in the case of uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the general American attitude was, we define uh, the, the purposes, and then you come in yeah. without any kind of consultation yeah. on a common setting of purposes. And that's, that's an old yeah. habit. The other point, just a, a small one, but from time to time, uh, it's not bad to be factually correct. Uh, when you talk about Bosnia, uh, uh, the United States was dragged into Bosnia very late in '95, largely, I hate to say, at the prodding of Chirac. And Chirac didn't do it out of idealism. He simply was disgusted at seeing what was happening to uh, the UN forces there, uh, the fifth net by the third. And he pushed and he pushed at the end of the This was '95. For four years of war. So it's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> yes. Uh, Monty Stearns, former CFIA fellow and former American diplomat, 
seems to me that the difficulty with humanitarian intervention is to keep it humanitarian. Mm -hmm. so reminded of uh, our intervention in Somalia and uh, the Bush administration, which began as purely humanitarian, and quickly turned political. And I suspect if we were to intervene in Darfur, that the easiest part of our task would be to the task of protection, so I would emphasize the more difficult I want just for a second to come back to this question of uh, is the world better, worse, and so on. It seems to me that it is so different the world <coughs> from, what, uh, from what the universe of traditional studies of international relations was. Partly because so much of the world uh, was never seen as playing any role. It was colony, it, it was uh, far away countries about which we know nothing. And all of those are now uh, either actors or visible victims, not protected anymore by the old barrier of sovereignty, uh, colonial sovereignty. So, so it's very difficult to compare. There are lots of reasons to find this uh, very unsatisfactory, particularly in the whole domain of development uh, and poverty. But to answer the gentleman who was afraid that the Europeans would not be happy with what he said. But I think he was very right in many things he did. And as a European, I have to say we should not be so happy with what he did. We didn't want to help, and he is right, to sell troops to Afghanistan. And very recently I was in a meeting with the Secretary General of NATO in Belgium <coughs> with the think tank of all Belgians hated Bush, and who were thinking, now we'll have a better world. With Obama, everything will be wonderful. And so the Secretary General said to all these very important elders, what do you think? That America is going to change the policy? Obama will also ask you for help. And then it's on your honeymoon. Because now you could say, we are not going to send anybody to Afghanistan, as long as Bush is there. What are you going to say when Obama so now they are all preparing to say no to Obama in a different way, nicer and nicer. <laughs> 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 uh, Nigel Davis, uh, former student of Stanley and now British Ambassador to Belarus. Um, uh, I'll pass over in silence with the, the question of the, the role of the global financial crisis on the UK. If you want to see something really interesting, have a look at its effect on Russia right now. Uh, it seemed to me that swirling around the uh, discussion of international law earlier, and also some of the discussions before that, was a question, a question about the role of practitioners. Um, that, this is explicit in the example of uh, John Bolton, of course. But uh, it seemed to me, too, that any discussion of the role of ethics, just war and so on, international relations, ipso facto, uh, is an intense practical interest for those who face sometimes appalling dilemmas as practitioners. So I welcome any uh, questions, any thoughts uh, or commentary you might have about the role of bringing the role of practitioners or practitioner perspectives into the, the academic study of international relations. I have sometimes worried that those two that were communities are more estranged than they, than they might be. Um, not just a matter of, uh, of uh, consulting for governments, uh, though that's very welcome, but how do you bring or how might we bring institutionally uh, the perspectives that practitioners offer to actually have to you know, do these damn things out there into the building of your theories. Thank you. I was at, I was at a panel at ISA uh, uh, last year where Steve Krasner spoke about this very easily. Steve was in policy planning alliance. And it, on the one hand, it's uh, academia has diverted, has, been, has diverged much farther from policy making in the last year. Your career and my uh, service. 
the same journals aren't read anymore by the by academic policy. And certainly the, the divergence and much of that is on the academic side becoming more technical and more social scientific. The other side, Steve reports that if somebody, if, if, if you're in, in Washington in some policy job, he was at a policy clinic, and somebody calls you a professor, you know you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> There was, uh, I, as I understand it, the founding of the Center for International Affairs, now the Weatherhead Center, was based on this premise. The idea was that that, uh, that the, the center existed, this was 1958, I think. The center existed to bring primarily 15 diplomats to Harvard and to have set up interaction between them and the university. The university's <laughs> changed, the world has changed. I, I mean, doing it today uh, has as Bob indicated, both on the theoretical side, but maybe on the practical side, too. I, I'm not positive, but I'm not sure the United States sends somebody from the State Department every year anymore. No, no, they used no, to. No, 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 nobody else. No, but, uh, yeah. I mean, they, they, but, but the policy side has changed, too. The policy side, I mean, it's a relentless, they vary in specialization across the board, right? The policy side has become much more professionalized as well, and the middle has been filled in by policy think tanks which are very specialized in delivering the goods in real time right now to people who can put the stuff on the policy suggest that you know well in, 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 in your line of work. So I think the, the, the there is stuff that flows back and forth, but it often flows intermediated through mm -hmm. these, these, these channels so that even if you don't see it going all the way from one to the other, I, we, we're in the interesting position at Princeton, oddly, of having a, a you know, well-respected Political Science Department, International Relations Group, where over half the senior faculty have served in government. Um, and I think we did that by hiring almost every person who could be hired in an absolutely top-ranked international relations faculty who had served in government. I mean, we sort of were the only department. That's how many people there are allowed to really, you know, could, could, you know, you could give it one department like that, but there aren't that many people out there. It's, it's hard to do. Um, but I think nowadays you have to be very careful about looking for opportunities uh, to do this because they're they're fewer than they, they were before, and we actively inside the university, you know, encourage opportunities to try to publicize, you know, results and, and move results back and forth. But it has to be done actively by the university, um, and there has to be you know very active interest in the university in doing that. Part of the reason I think it works in our context is. Like some universities, our public policy school and our academic department are joined with joint departments, unlike the structure here where the public policy school is separate. So there's no question that Harvard has a very strong academic involvement in, in the public policy world, but it's mostly just Kennedy School, which is a separate public policy school, right? The Princeton are joined, and that permits the academic department to be more connected with public policy. So, now, you know, political theorists and moral philosophers generally don't serve. <laughs> Ever since Machiavelli, it's been our ambition to whisper in the ear. <laughs> what you're suggesting is that sometimes we should let the prince whisper in, in our ear. And I think that, in fact, the development of just war theory has, has worked that way, that there is an interaction of, um, of ethicists and philosophers with um, with uh, salt. <laughs> Stanley and I had a concrete case in class in the course on episode back at the time of the Costco War because a student got up and criticized at length the idea that the Allies were flying at uh, 30,000 feet to be sure that they couldn't be hit by uh, surface air missiles and that therefore that made them incapable of distinguishing between civilians and non-civilians on the ground. And a pilot got up who, who had just come back from flying F-16 and said, you misunderstand the technology. When I'm flying at 30,000 feet, the radar cone is broader and I can see much more. If I fly at 5,000 feet where I'm subject to anti-aircraft fire, 
and I'm also flying at 700 miles an hour, everything's a blur. So that the argument really was, I mean, they turned the argument around be based on simply the technology of what was at work in the tank. Ben, would you like to have the last word? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like in our usual fashion, since I'm commenting on your Monday lecture and you haven't given me any text, I have 20 minutes to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob, you've, you've taken some of my courses, you know what I'm doing. <laughs>